I can tell you with like 99% confidence that I don't think that'll ever happen. Oh, I don't think it'll ever happen. <laughs> yeah. That's what I want. <laughs> Bungie <laughs> has time and time again said, like, we want players to be able to take their weapons that they get from anywhere and bring them to anywhere else yeah. all the time and not have or not feel any or a significant difference. Welcome, everybody, to the Casually Hardcore Podcast. My name is Brian. This is episode 34, and we're bringing in Dado. Uh, Dado, thank you so much for joining us on this uh, Just News Week full of Destiny 2 information. Uh, we asked Dado to come on to talk about the state of Destiny 2 and what really kind of makes it an MMO, uh, you know, and where the game probably needs to go, what we want to see with Shadowkeep overall. Uh, we've got a crazy... Uh, podcast, a lot of stuff to talk about here. So to kind of just jump into it, uh, Data, why don't you introduce yourself to those who might not have seen your content uh, or know who and what you do over on YouTube and Twitch? Sure. Uh, so I'm Dado. Uh, I primarily cover a lot of PVE-based content in Destiny, but recently uh, that focus has kind of switched from guides and instructions and, and all that over to more uh, commentary and thoughts on the game and, and people kind of come to me for that more nowadays than they do um, for PvE stuff uh, but I still like to do a lot of PvE dabble in PvP a little bit you know I'm not bad but I'm definitely not the best at all um, and yeah so I, I just kind of provide a lot of uh, grand scale commentary like large you know focus on uh, just the, the bigger picture of the game as opposed to more specific things. Now, I've been following your channel pretty much since the start of Destiny, and that's uh, what they call Destiny 2 Year 3, or in my mind, I just think of it as Destiny Year 6 as we're going, uh, kind of as we barrel forward. You're coming up over, uh, about to cross over 1 million subscribers on YouTube. So, uh, you know, a little early pre-congrats to you there. So be Thank sure you. to go and follow uh, Dado on YouTube. If you guys aren't already, links will be in the description of the description of this podcast when it goes live on YouTube here on Monday. So uh, before we <laughs> before we uh, continue on, though, I do want to say uh, you can find this podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud. And if you missed our last show, we had Az from Heel vs. Babyface on, and we talked a little bit about 14 and well, uh, but and a lot about everything else under the sun. And we do want to also say thanks to our partnership with Exit Lag. If you guys are interested, you can check out uh, the link in the description. You can uh, have three free days, and you can use the code Work for 20% off if you sign up, if you're having any kind of uh, <laughs> lag issues with your games. Check them out, thank them, and with the business stuff out of the way, um, before the show we were kind of talking about WoW Classic, uh, I want to jump in with kind of our history with MMO, starting with you, Datto. Uh, we asked you the, the real important question. And you gave us the best answer possible. Where do I find the time? So what is your history with MMOs? So I started playing World of Warcraft back in, I want to say like June 2005. Uh, all my friends were playing it. Like I only started playing it because all of them, that's all they would talk about. I was the last one of our friend circle to uh to start playing because they all they were talking about was wow this well that and i was like fine i'll make a character like i'll do this and uh i was hooked pretty darn quick and i played pretty hardcore uh up until uh i graduated college um so about six years and uh yeah all throughout high school it was literally just drop pack pack backpack on floor go downstairs into basement play until i had to go to bed um so I played for quite a long time. I quit multiple times in college and then came back uh, just because it, it was wow in the past. Like we didn't know how good we had it. But um, so I played a lot during college, especially my senior year. Um, and then the day that I graduated, that's when I quit because I realized if I didn't quit, I would just never have a job or like do anything and like after you graduate college like that's it like you have to be an adult now 
<laughs> and I was not going to be able to be an adult with World of Warcraft in my life. So I just kind of had to stop. Um, I've also played, you know, Terra. I played Terra when it first came out. Um, I played a little bit of Aeon. And then it's basically just been Destiny ever since for the most part. So uh, you said, uh, obviously, that we have a, we Chris and I both actively play multiple MMOs right now. Chris has been doing uh, and getting ready for WoW Classic. So y'all have uh, essentially that in common. What did you main, like, when you played uh, WoW back in the day before you kind of stepped away from it originally? I played three years as a warrior. And then the first time I came back, uh, and I guess every time thereafter, I played a, uh, a shaman, mainly enhancement. Uh, as like the sole enhancement shaman of most of the guilds that I ended up being in. Chris, how about you? I mean, the roles back then, you were really limited. You really got slotted for kind of your one thing. Um, I played Druid as my main for the majority from 2004. For the Burning Crusade, uh, I moved guilds to be more in like a progression raid environment. And so I ended up switching to Hunter. And so like I was our first Beastmaster Hunter before that went on a big run of just being the tear. And uh, so I, I played Hunter for all of the Burning Crusade, and then I ended up switching um, to follow another friend over to Malganus. I moved back to Horde and uh, went back to my my Druid roots. And I had played mostly Resto and Balance back and forth, just whatever I was slotted as. Um, and then I raided all the way through Pandaria. And then, I don't know, somewhere in Pandaria, I just woke up one day and it just, I realized like I was feeling obligated to put my shift in on wow like i had to log in and they had released the daily caps and all these things and i just felt like i have to do all this play and then i get to decide what i want to do that's fun today and like wow wasn't part of the fun <laughs> it was just the tasks that i had to do and then once i was done with those tasks i could do the things i actually enjoyed in the game um but i felt like there was this obligation so i got off that and i took a break and then brian had been begging me to play final fantasy with him um for years at that point and so, all right, i'm a bad salesman realm reborn, realm reborn came back and and i was like all right a realm reborn they're saying it's better i'll hop in and i've been mostly on final fantasy since um that's been my predominant main i've taken brief breaks to go into eso i've, I've played guild wars over the years i've enjoyed eve online's a fantastic escape from the traditional mmo experience um but mostly final fantasy is where i spend my time now so for me, I would say that uh, like my first introduction to the MMO uh, was Final Fantasy XI. Before that, though, my first online RPG, because I feel like there's a difference and like ideally that will be what some of the this podcast helps to kind of at least talk about, was uh, Fantasy Star Online. Back on the Dreamcast, really just loved that game a lot. And it was interesting because for the, for me at the time, I never realized it, but looking back, uh, they had this sense of offline and online. Like this online world was still so unknown what it means, where obviously great economists would say like the online world is like, will have no impact on the economy and all these like crazy predictions. Nintendo saying it was a fad. And it's just like, as you kind of wade into that. So that was kind of my experience. And then, uh, you know, I played actually a lot of 14, like in 1.0. And I just have a, like, I've always had kind of a, a connection or a draw to the Final Fantasy series as a whole. Um, that's why I think Destiny was so interesting to me. And I just, I dived into it. And I wouldn't have considered, like, it was kind of toying around with what then coined people uh, the term MMO light. You know, it's like it has these MMO type of features and, the, and, and these kind of things. And so then I went and spent uh, a lot of time kind of actually bouncing around between Final Fantasy and Destiny up into the point where I, like... <laughs> I say famously quit because for the longest time it was our number one video on YouTube. I had no concept of it when I left Destiny 2 at Trials of uh, Osiris. I was just like, all right, I've 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 given them everything I can give them and I'm done. And uh, and so... You mean Curse, Curse of Osiris? Thank you. Yeah. So I, I get a time frame? Okay. Yeah, Curse of Osiris. Like trials, yeah. everyone, like a lot no, of No, I love the Trials yeah. of Osiris. Curse of Osiris, very different story. Yes. Yeah, very fitting. Thank you very much for the correction because I was like... I just want to clarify. <laughs> no, it was the uh, it was the Curse of Osiris that really felt like uh, kind of a punch in the stomach and it brought about this level of frustration. And that's where I got off the Destiny train. And we had uh, recently uh, Rick Caucus come back and talk about like, is it now the time to return? And so my first question and the first general topic for Destiny 2 as an MMO is that, uh, Data, why does Destiny 2 deserve another look for players like myself or for players who have stepped away 
uh, at the Curse of Osiris, and now looking as we go into Shadowkeep, who didn't maybe come back with Forsaken? Um, well, uh, the number one reason, I would say, is Bungie finally kind of got it together with Forsaken. Um, Forsaken, I think, beats Taken King in terms of, like, best expansion that they've ever put out. And Taken King was pretty highly revered. Um, they've brought back a lot of stuff. They've uh, changed the weapon system back to, you know, uh, or not back to, but just they made the weapon system a lot better. So you're not just having two primaries. Uh, they buffed supers. So supers are coming around more often. Abilities, uh, tons of new weapons and, and good, better campaign, great raids. Uh, they've just generally speaking, given you more to grind for, They've uh, they have a triumph system, aka achievements. Um, just they've added so much to the game over the past was it been year and a half since Curse of Osiris, and the stuff that they've given us has been pretty pretty good. So, um, Season of Opulence, uh, which launched in June, was probably the best uh, content launch of the past year mm -hmm. since Forsaken. Um, we've had like three seasons, essentially season of uh, season of the Forge, season of the Drifter, season of Opulence, and uh, I think Opulence is definitely um, the most liked out of all of them. So yeah, it's just they've they've just kind of gotten it together and and gotten back to like almost D one status of like, hey, we have like a complete sort of game, and now we can focus on expanding the game itself instead of having to rework you know, so many of these systems, even though I say that armor 2.0 is coming, which is a rework of the armor system uh, and a reintroduction of stats on gear because we didn't have stats like we did in destiny one, like strength, intellect, discipline, whatever. Right. So now those are coming back as well. So there's just a lot of stuff coming back. What, uh, what I actually really enjoyed about the armor 2.0 kind of reveal, and I don't know if Chris has been able to catch up on it, but this is kind of speaks to my personality type is that when mods were consumable, I never use them. Like it would be, I would all, like for whatever reason, there is this, it's a part of my personality. There's this weird holdup where I get nervous. Oh, I, and then you change out gear and then it's, you know, oh, I might need that. I might get a better piece of gear, but mods are now unlocked. And then with that unlock, you can just kind of apply them to the gear. I'm really excited about that. I actually, in Final Fantasy 14, really struggle with that with uh, with with the materia system in which that you kind of have these the, the, these uh, you know slotted you know gems that you can put in and uh, and you can actually remove them for like there's a risk on that but I still struggle with that it is actually something that I'm actively trying to pursue to get over within Final Fantasy as opposed to that and when I saw that for the mod 2.0 uh, just that change alone it was just this sense of relief the sense of like oh if I f up it's okay <laughs> right. you know um, yeah. if i'm running a suboptimal build i don't have to go and try to figure out what i'm doing wrong i can i can play around with it a lot easier and thus brings in more that rpg uh aspect of it what's um what stood out to you from that from that reveal because that was yesterday we were originally scheduled to do the podcast and then they scheduled that and i was like no you do you that's yeah more, that's more important um what stood out to you from that from that reveal as the most exciting and then what questions do you still have um, I wasn't too surprised by the reveal simply because they teased a bunch of images in a previous video, like a couple months ago, that basically outlined like what this system was going to be. So just by seeing some pictures from very small clips of a video, we were able to kind of piece together like, oh, this is probably how it's going to work. And then Bungie did the live stream and was like, this is how it works. And I was like, we were right. <laughs> so none of that was really a huge surprise. I think honestly, the hugest surprise to me had nothing to do with armor 2.0. It had to do with weapons of light coming back on uh, ward of dawn, which is a uh, Titan ability where yeah. you drop a giant bubble just for, yeah. Increases your, your damage output. Yeah. Yeah. And this was an ability back in destiny one mm -hmm. that they're now bringing back in destiny two. Um, so honestly, that was probably the biggest surprise to me just because I saw you know the pictures from the from the video and i was like i mean I, i've seen this this concept before you have a certain amount of energy you can spend you can put in mods and you spend the energy and then when you have no more you are done and so it was, it's pretty simple to understand um so i don't think anything was 
terribly surprising uh, or exciting just because we knew what was going to be happening. Is that a good thing or a bad thing in your mind? That it wasn't surprising? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think it's really either. Like, it was surprising when we saw it in the video two months ago. Mm -hmm. That's when it was surprising. Uh, and then they just kind of came out and clarified what's actually going to be happening. So that was just more of like, oh, we finally know how it works as opposed to like, what are they doing? <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, just I, maybe I guess another big surprise was just finally they're starting to actually show percentages and mm -hmm. numbers in the game. So with uh, with stats, there's currently three stats in the game. Armor, <clears throat> sorry, uh, resilience, mobility, resilience, right. Resilience, recovery, mobility. And they go up one to 10 and there's no hints at all in game as to what they do. Like they just give a one, like one sentence, like mobility makes you faster. And like resilience increases this. And there's no numbers or percentages or more, uh, a better description of those things at all. And then finally they've made it. So those things in game are actually going to tell players what they do and how many of a stat increases this thing, this thing, this thing. And that's something players, it seems so simple, right? Like every MMO has that kind of stuff. It seems so simple, but it's stuff that we've been asking for for so long. Just give us numbers, give us information. And I, I hope that Bungie's finally coming around to that and, and actually giving us just, we just want to know numbers and just percentages and that's, that's it. I'm still trying to convince Chris to join me. Chris, how important is that for you? Or you were about to jump in. So, yeah. I, I, Destiny one was such an enjoyable experience. Um, it was such a departure from anything else I'd played. Uh, and I was enjoying it. And then destiny two comes along and they're like, we're going to reset you. It's like, oh, I disagree with that design decision, but I'll trust you. Let's, let's jump off the, the edge together. And, um, and so I liked the majority of Destiny 1. I mean, if, if there was anything that didn't work for me, it's probably because I was still playing other things at the same time. So when people were saying, oh, I don't like this aspect of it, or, you know, I wasn't really willing to like point my finger that hard because I thought, well, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me that's not taking the game serious enough. Um, but I think what stopped me from really engaging with Destiny 2 is that it didn't feel like that MMO and yet it didn't feel like a shooter. So like a shooter like like Halo, I can jump in at any time with my friends. I can pick up a few rounds and the only thing that needs to be improved is me. My accuracy round to round, my ability to move around the map round to round is me. There's nothing I'm really leveling up. There's a cosmetic system, but that's about it. Now with a MMO, it's very different. My character needs to grow and, and become this like more of a DD and d like RPG experience. And Destiny kind of just straddled that line. And I always wanted them to just, just pick a side. So either balance your PvP and make it round based. Everybody gets the same weapons at the beginning of the round. Lean into that because there's such good gunplay in Destiny. Or lean into your RPG roots and let me let me build and invest in a character. And because of the like stats on gear and all of that, I just, I, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited to see them going back to this. So I, I think this is, that's what stopped me from wanting to be in is that I felt like up until recently, it, I guess until like the last year and a half, uh, I felt like maybe they were going away from that. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. What do you think Beto? Um, well, I mean, you're not wrong in that they didn't really give you a lot of RPG stuff at the very beginning of Destiny 2. They, they basically gave you nothing, right? Once you had an item, that was it. There was no random rolls. There was no stat hunting. There was none of that. It was masked by a, a great campaign. And that's the thing where, like, we played through it. Everything felt great. And then you got out at the other end of it and you're like, wait, where did everything go? Right. And it, I mean, it blindsided everybody who was playing, too. It blindsided me. And uh, so it was definitely disappointing at launch. Mm -hmm. uh, they have since gone back on a lot of those decisions. And now there's a lot of stats and even more stats coming to the game and more gear hunting and optimization and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And they're interested in more mods. Uh, so there's definitely a lot more on the RPG min max kind of side, um, even though it's not as impactful as like a regular MMO, mm -hmm. like you know, having having exactly perfect stats doesn't matter as much in Destiny because 90% of the gameplay is shooting guns. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have a good gun, even if your stats are not great, 
like if you can shoot a gun you're gonna contribute well accuracy is still like also that skill and that that importance because they're you know a good gun or not good gun if you can't hit the broadside of a barn you're not gonna have a good time just kind of like chris and i were talking about wow classic uh (laughs) before the show and how like just hit the hit stat the hit cap was is is a value if you can't hit what you're trying to hit yeah. You know, then oh no, I I played Fury Water. I had my Edge Masters gauntlets on all the time in raids. Like I I I completely understand. So yeah, you definitely like you can be given some of the best guns in the game, but if you don't know how to shoot, then you're not gonna do anything with them. Yeah. So stats stats can only go so far for you as a player because it's a shooter and it relies on aim as opposed to MMOs, which is just like you find enemy, click on enemy, stand near it, and do your moves. So one of the things that stood out to me about just the stat reveal, because we're getting, you know, that intelligence, that strength, uh, you know, that back. And those have a a realistic impact. And what they showed us in the stat values with Destiny 2, which I thought I was really excited, was that percentage. Here's your mobility. By increasing it further, which when the gear actually has the stats that you can see, and by masterworking the gear, and all of a sudden the stats just go up by two, like that has me excited to go and, and grind out the current, you know, th- those those upgrades for the gear itself. But then all of a sudden it's like, oh, if I, if I really want a mobility build, if I increase it to the next level, it's going to jump up to a 16% increase in speed. Like that for me is something that is measurable. That means that I can kind of really play around with what kind of build that I want. Do I want my super back faster? Do I want my grenade back faster? Do I want to be able to punch and do the melee more often and being able to see those uh, kind of where I rank up and stuff like that is exciting. But what it also does, it doesn't really communicate the MMO has, we would traditionally say what it communicates more is, a class-based shooter like we've seen that obviously with apex and things like that and what here's my base class and here's how i want to modify that to try to be the most optimum the downside of class and that and those kind of you know obviously that kind of level of customization is meta and it's something you've talked about heavily uh you recently actually just released a great video you you rant about pvp and at the tail end of it you toss in a little pve just to piss everybody off uh yep. but you talk about that and you talk about the current state of the problems for that and to summarize your video uh to the audience right here is that you talk about the 6v6 and the map design you talk about supers coming back more often in context to the, what we just saw with 2.0 and not knowing yet what they have plans for PvP, because they said that they have big plans coming for year three. They're we, actually going to be talking about it in like an hour. Oh, wow. Well, great. Yeah. <laughs> well, by the time I, this goes I, up. I, I think I think so, rather. It could be either today or uh, basically the one of the directors of the game has been putting out is putting out a three part series mm. uh, going over like you know the first part was like the past six months and now it's like okay here's what we're looking at in shadow keep so he gave like a list of topics that he's gonna be talking about pvp was on that list Mm -hmm. i don't know if it'll be on part two or part three but it's coming soon so what like from that perspective though uh what do you want to see like when when shadow keep goes live october 1st what are you looking for uh just in general with shadow keep uh for pvp uh, for PvP, um, ideally, it would be a mishmash of <clears throat> stuff that we've had from Destiny 1 and stuff that we've had from Destiny 2. Uh, right now, a big problem in PvP, I think, is power ammo. Power ammo is way, uh, uses, uh, or rather, power weapons are way, way stronger than the other weapons in your other slots. Is it impossible to fight back against power weapons? No. Is it really, 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 really difficult? Yes. And uh, the way Destiny 1 handled it was that if you were near the power ammo drop, when the game dropped it, everyone uh, everyone near the box got ammo. You messed around for like 30, 60 seconds. Everyone used all their heavy ammo. Blah, 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 and then it was done. In Destiny 2, it comes around like every minute or so. Mm-hmm. So there's no consistency to gameplay. It's just you never know who might have power ammo at any given moment. And it creates very frustrating times where you just you don't know how to tackle any given situation because you play it perfectly but if they just happen to have power ammo at that one time you're just you're dead um another issue is uh supers so supers are very very strong abilities that basically let you insta give most people in a pvp match um i'm fine with a lot of supers but the issue is that by the time everyone has cycled through all of their supers in a match, the people who were first are now getting their super back. So the first two minutes of a game, 
is fine. You know, first two, three minutes, everyone's shooting each other and, and having a good time. And then the supers start coming in. And for like the next two or three minutes, you're having to fight back against these supers, which are very difficult to fight against mm -hmm. 1v1 at least. Yeah. And then by the time everyone's done, you have maybe 30 seconds of more combat and then more supers coming in. So you're, it's not about fighting other people. It's just running away from these crazy abilities and all this crazy power ammo and weapons. And it's just, it's not, it doesn't feel like PVP. It feels like running away yeah. in, unenthusiastically. When I, when I returned to Destiny 2 I, and I stepped into PVP, I was like, it is different. Like from even when it launched, I was like, Oh yeah. It was like, everything was fusion rifles or snipers or like I, it was whatever was one hit kill. Like it was just like, everything's a one hit kill. I don't, Oh, somebody's over there. And it's like, shroom, and it's like, okay, well, yeah. I got to well, figure out the you, new meta. If you quit during curse of Osiris, curse of Osiris had the double primary yeah. weapon system, which are not fast killing weapons. And then they changed it so that special weapons, which do have the ability to one shot hit someone, uh, were reintroduced into those uh, other weapon slots. So yeah. you could actually use those weapons a lot more often than you could in the first year. The uh, One of the most satisfying things about the, the PvP of Destiny 1, as you described it with the power ammo, was being a warlock and being able to kind of go to the enemy team that were all huddled around. The power ammo was about to drop. All six people just freaking rain death on them. Yeah, that Big was risk a, reward. Oh, it was fun. Yeah, it was. It was I, really I totally good. Agree. It was, but it was a part of the strategy because it would spawn right. in two spots. That essentially was almost like, uh, regardless of the type, was like whether it was control or not. Like that was a part of the match where there was kind of a cadence in which that it was like, yeah, let's all go gather here. And so if you would basically then risk, like if you had a super, like you're like, well, I'm gonna just sacrifice power ammo because I if if I can take it out before it spots i'll pick up that for myself or if nothing else i might be able to knock out the entire team and get right. one of those great like <laughs> space magic yeah. achievements or uh, medals oh, man. <laughs> and and now you don't you definitely don't have that right. anymore honestly oh. for me like as a like if i run warlock it's it's more about whatever is the the roaming like a roaming super is more valuable than like that because i don't often find like clusters of of players together on the map like you would where the you know the void uh, you know, Warlock was just the most powerful. Um, right. Chris, like, I, like PvP is a constant debate with us within our community. Last night we were having this, and this I want to tie this into the uh, what makes Destiny or the direction for the MMO overall. But uh, you, you obviously raise up a lot of concerns because if, like, if we were going to, if somebody was going to come in and, and check out this game with new light, uh, you know, having that arc, that the grind element, uh, and that that wreckage of PvP. Uh, is a problem. Is that something that competitive should uh, strive to ad uh, adjust? Is that a new mode within PvP? What do you want to see uh, that would be the most advantageous for the most amount of people, Chris? Um, so I, I think PvP and PvE are just inherently different. Uh, it's awesome when there's like a cross between, but I think that cross means to mostly be in that like aspirational content. So that like cosmetic aspect. Um, it's really frustrating when a elite pve or finds out that pvp can drop the same eye level in any game and it's really frustrating when a pvp or can get killed by somebody that went off and killed some boss it's like what does your ability to kill some boss have to do with one-shotting me uh and so i i, I would like to see personally granted this is i'm somebody who i got off of destiny they and they're yet to convince me to come back um so i'm probably not the person they should be listening to as opposed to their core audience but i, I would love to see PvP be more separated. So it's like, hey, this week we're going to give everybody this epic hand cannon. And then we're going to tell you, if you want that hand cannon, here's the PvE content you need to get, you need to go do. Right? So like, here's what you need to do. So everybody in there is balanced and fair and just the best player wins. And then you're encouraging people, feel free, go explore that PvE content. Go go try that out. Kind of like a last gun situation in which that you just kind of cycle through weapons or something? Kind of more like, so like Halo, where, but where the special weapons that spawn are are select things and kind of featuring them each week like you would in a MOBA where you say, hey, the free players get access to these guns. And then if you'd like to have access to them full time, so that week, maybe you can take those guns into PvE too or something like that in a limited fashion. And then, and then just like in a MOBA, they say, hey, if you know, if you want to play with them all the time, I'll take that money whenever you're ready. Um, I can tell you with 
like 99% confidence that I, I don't think that'll ever happen. Oh, I don't think it'll yeah. ever happen. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I want. And Bungie <laughs> has time and time again said, like, we want players to be able to take their weapons that they get from anywhere and bring them to anywhere else yeah. all the time and not have or not feel any or a significant difference. So for the 17 people that you think are playing the competitive playlist, like, what do you, where, where do you want, um, Luke Smith, where do you want, uh, you know, the, the director, the direction of, pvp to go because like when i think of competitive i think of level playing field uh etc but if no one's playing that playlist like do they do we just drop it or do we move uh or do we mold it into something different i mean <clears throat> for for destiny competitive they need to give it a lot more love they need to give it more features more support more rewards more incentive to play it in the first place very powerful weapons can come from playing competitive but it's only been getting easier and easier to get those weapons. And the requirements to get those weapons have also been getting easier and easier. Um, and past basically a certain rank, so the ranking system in Destiny is 0 to 5,500. Mm -hmm. uh, once you hit 2,100, that's been like uh, the, the area where it's like the game will give you the gun. Like there's other requirements too, but generally speaking, the game wants you to hit 2,100. And then that's like one of the biggest requirements to get one of these guns. Once you hit that ranking, there's no real reason to go play it unless you're chasing a title in the game called Unbroken, um, which requires you to hit the highest rank possible in the game three times, which is just not going to be possible for the overwhelming majority of the player base. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not a real incentive to go play it. If you're not grinding for a pinnacle weapon, there's no real incentive to go play it. There's no rewards. Uh, the ranking system is not great. Uh, there's very little protections against, you know, people who don't load into a game and playing a game, you know, 3v4 or something like that. Leaving games, uh, it, it just doesn't have any support. And I think if you're going to have competitive or call something competitive, then it needs to have the support that other competitive experiences have. Mm -hmm. And Destiny is nowhere close to having any of that support whatsoever. So for me, it's either you need to give it significantly more love and make it into a thing or like they've done with other things in the past, like faction rallies and trials of Osiris. You just need to get rid of it mm -hmm. and just don't even include it anymore and even bring back an old favorite like trials of Osiris, yeah. trials of the nine, and because at least people played that and like wanted to play it and and had fun with that experience. Not just as a player, but for me, it was also the most interesting content to watch. The Trials yeah. of Cyrus and then uh, you know, the Trials of the Nine. Like, that was something that was, even if I wasn't participating in it that weekend, it was something that was the most interesting to watch and have seen stream uh, at the at the same time. So I'm, I'm with you 100%. It, it grew several Twitch channels. Like, Real Crafty is is definitely one of the most popular. He uh, He's, you know, exploded in popularity and plays tons of other games now solely because of trials of osiris and because how good he was at destiny right and people want to tune in to watch him be good at other video games because he's really good at other video games so uh on that note because i i want to i want to kind of dive into the concept of destiny as an mmo like i said at the top of the show luke sure. smith came out and said we're an action mmo and for me two things brought me well three things technically uh activision bungee split i was like okay like i didn't come back but i was like Tell me more, you know, like yeah. that is, th that is essentially where for me was like, is that the root of the evil? I don't know, but right now it's, that's what the evidence is showing. We'll have to wait, ultimately wait and see a, a good judge will be sometime in December or in January where that kind of falls one year after, you know, uh, give or take. Now, the other piece was cross save. Like that was like, okay, like that is, that is actually the thing that I was like, okay, great. I'm back. Like, I'm going to go update the clients that I have. Uh, cause that's something that seems really cool. And then the third thing, uh, was the action MMO. Now it says to me as a, as a MMO, like an avid MMORPG fan, and they were obviously embracing the, the RPG ness. And, and then we had a question on, on Twitter and we was talking about like the, there's MMO and then there's MMORPG. Those are two ultimately big different concepts. But that tells me as a player, as somebody, is, as a gamer, that that's not where they are, but that's where they're going. Because I define MMO, obviously, as massively multiplayer online. And at the core of it, they're not there yet. But if that's what they're going to finally start labeling the game, I, that tells me that's where they're going. And it's a worthwhile investment of my time 
to go along the journey with them. So, but that's the question I put to you, Dado. What is an MMO as it applies to Destiny? Is it an MMO today? Uh, and if not, what do you expect to see over the course? And this is a, I'm assuming another long journey, not like by next yeah. year or Shadowkeep. Um, Destiny has always been an MMO. Activision just never wanted to call it an MMO because the term MMO to a lot of people is very scary. It's a very scary gaming term because when you think of MMO, you think of World of Warcraft, now you think of Final Fantasy, you think of all these super, super heavy, grindy games. Maybe you're paying a subscription fee as well if your knowledge is still back in, you know, 2008 or something like that. I'm still paying you a know, sub. <laughs> if, you, if you've never played an MMO before, you're yeah. probably thinking like, I got to pay 15 bucks a month to play this game and it's super grindy and all that kind of stuff. So from a marketing standpoint, Destiny was never called an MMO until very recently, probably because Activision did not want Bungie to call it an MMO. They wanted to call it a shooter because shooters will have much more mass appeal and they'll sell better and all that kind of stuff. And they didn't want to, you know, perpetuate the idea that, uh, you know, Destiny's MMO, you have to play super grindy and all this kind of stuff. And you have to play with other people um, because I'm sure that was something that they worried about too, is like, you know, having to play with other people for a lot of, players of video games out there is like something that they don't do, or maybe it's intimidating or they just don't want to do it. Um, so they've always pushed shooter. It's a shooter, shared world shooter, shared world shooter. Um, but now that they finally called it an MMO, it doesn't really change too much. Like it just maybe kind of reemphasizes that they want it to be, um, or they want to maybe drift towards the MMO RPG side of things. I don't think it's an MMORPG yet. Like, I wouldn't give it that title. I think Action MMO is much more appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's for, for me, it's always been an MMO. It's just been what terminology did they use to market the game as opposed to what it actually is because it's really big and it's online and there's a lot of people playing it. So I think it already fit the term MMO quite well. Uh and it fits a lot of those, you know, other MMO kind of things. Strikes or dungeons, raids or raids. You have certain uh, continents in the planets, patrol zones that you can go around questing. A lot of the elements are already there. It was just marketing. Chris, what do you think? No, I think it's I think it's always been an MMO, um, and that's honestly where like a lot of my frustration came from is when it wasn't living up to that, but it wasn't becoming more arcade like it just felt like it kind of lost its identity for me when i left and so if it's if it's getting all that back and like the armor 2.0 system sounds intriguing enough to come back and try it um it's it's definitely it's definitely an mmo and to define an mmo i, I think massive is is one of the questionable terms there but destiny's well over that threshold so i don't i don't know where i don't know if you have to draw like a line in the sand and one one active user less you're not m and and one over but somewhere there's a line because like we capital can only, m or lowercase yeah, m <laughs> yeah if six if six people are playing the game it's not massive and if 150,000 are it is massive i don't know where the line is um it doesn't feel like an RPG, even though it's had a story like Destiny 2. I really enjoyed that story experience that first weekend when I just played the crap out of the game. I really enjoyed it, um, but I, it doesn't feel like the traditional RPG. It's not so different, like uh, like maybe an Eve Online or something where you've totally departed. Um, but it's definitely not in the same mold of your Final Fantasies, your World of Warcrafts, your ESOs, your Guild Wars, all of that, um, where there's much more of like a sense of I guess like character, uh, it, it it is always encouraged, almost like a hot swapping mentality. At least the way I've always enjoyed it. Like if you if you want to switch to Warlock, just switch to Warlock. Like it's never been a big deal. So I've never felt that same level of like character ownership. Um, even though I always did feel I owned my gear, which is why the Destiny Two hit hurt so bad, is because I felt like that was one thing I did earn. Is like I earned that light level, and you're like, well, we're gonna reset that. And I'm like, well, every every MMO when you get an expansion kind of resets it. I'm like, no, no, we're gonna really reset it. So, oh, I strongly disagree with that because um, <laughs> I own my Destiny One experience, and you just took it from me. Uh, so I, I I agree, it's an MMO. I think that's one of the things that makes PvP hard. And that's that's kind of a traditional symptom of an MMO is most MMOs do PvP really poorly. Um, a, a handful of times you get to enjoy it, but it's always something that if you have good PvE content, generally the PvP content suffers. Uh, I don't know any game out there that's 
rocking and rolling on both at the same time. Can you guys think of one? Um, I mean, I have theories. Like, I, I like Guild Wars too, but that doesn't mean I'm current with the meta. That doesn't mean I'm current. I know that the the 14 as a game uh, overall has great PVE, and I want to love the PvP. But that's where <laughs> that's where Destiny becomes that that aspect of uh, like that I love. Like, that's where it's like it's a game like where Dado was talking to us before the show where do you find like where does he have the time like he he would check out 14 but there's where, like where do you get the time there's just no way to fit it in in a busy schedule and that's where for me i'm like well i, I did my pve stuff i do my pvp stuff in destiny you know it's like you kind of for me ends up feeling that um you know both ways to answer the, the question because dad brought up a really cool point talking about marketing mm -hmm. i think the marketing is absolutely key when i look back over the overall frustration the call, calling it an mmo help set a tone. It might be a scary word, and I think that's a part of the game and the player base and, and streamers and various content creators uh, job to educate players on what it is and what it means. But here's where it is, is that when I looked at Destiny 2 and we talked about Activision kind of being the devil <laughs> in, uh, in the relationship, and even though, and people have countered me and said, uh, well, no, it was Bungie, like Activision says, it was Bungie's idea to do X. And I, I, I say that Activision said, Bungie, you have to hit this. I don't care how you do it. And then Bungie comes and says, okay, we've got this really hard goal to hit. Uh, how do we do that? And then they come up with a plan because they have to hit that goal. That's the relationship. That's the, that's the, 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 the <laughs> they've gotten into bed with each other. That's how they have to figure out how to do it. And so then Activision can always say like that. We told them like that they came up with that idea and it's like, and they're like, okay, yeah, you know, we can't really bad math them because they're writing the check. But I think when Activision looked at Destiny and when they did, uh, you know, their studies on why players like the game or don't like the game, they studied the wrong player base. And you end up getting Destiny 2 and you end up getting that leaning into shooter. And I don't know if they wanted uh, Destiny to compete with WoW. And that's one reason why they want to really label the shooter for the popularity perspective of it, because it is easier. But it set the wrong tone for players coming into the game. So you end up getting these uh, people who are like looking and expecting that shooter. And then all of a sudden they step into Oh, an MMO. And it ends up being like, and then they studied those people and that's how we got Destiny 2. They're like, oh, we want, you know, we don't want the MMO. We don't want the grind. We don't want the RPG. We just want that. And then once the people who love Destiny 1 got out of the, the, the story and then they're like, why would I play this week to week? <laughs> you know, there is no grind. I think, yeah. I think labeling it, marketing it is going to be a much stronger yeah. appeal for the game it's gonna be healthier for the game because you don't end up getting somebody coming in thinking they're playing fortnite you don't get somebody th coming in expecting minecraft like you're not sitting here trying to to tag it in the video so that literally people are like oh what is this and it's like it's okay not to like mmos like it's perfectly right. fine like nobody it is not a requirement to talk about video games to have to like everything that video like as an industry produces but i think that's going to be what makes it the healthiest for me though what I would like to see that uh, as a part of the MMO, and this is something that I've wanted from from D1, is a player economy. And this is just, I don't know if they'll ever do it. Um, they don't have to do it for me to enjoy the game. It's just something from an MMO, even though if we're not all playing at the same time. I don't need to see thousands of players fighting some kind of giant ogre. I don't need to see that. I, uh, technologically, that'd be really impressive. I just don't think we're there yet. The Battle Royale is impressive, but we're at 100. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, maybe, is that an MMO? It's our impact on each other. Our impact on, um, oh my gosh. If And it doesn't necessarily have to be like, I'm going to trade you Glimmer. It could be something where somebody did something in Destiny 2 and everybody else saw the effects of it for the week or for the month or something like that. Oh my gosh, you know, uh, Datto and his, and his team took out the raid boss. And then for whatever reason, there's some impact and that the ability to impact other players subtly or insubtly is essentially what I always kind of look for. It's not a requirement in the definition. It's, go ahead, Chris. I said like an Onyxia buff. I guess you didn't, you didn't play a lot of WoW, but like if you're standing in, in, or, in a capital city when onyxia goes down everybody gets a buff that was a yeah that was a thing back in the day yeah exactly and again i'm not making that a requirement for what means an mmo i'm just saying that's something that as an mmo somebody who enjoys them i love it when subtly or really impactfully the player as a whole are all contributing and we saw that with the dreaming city in a way right 
You know, it's like, and that's where when you, when you look at Luke Smith, who's the, the game, one of the game's directors, pedigree is that aspect, is that burning crusade, is that moment in which that as a community, things are happening. We're figuring out this together, whether it's a puzzle, whether it's something, but you just, and the, and the cool thing about why I say Destiny is an MMO is that beyond the game and playing it and with cross save, even more so it breaks down these walls that keep us separate. So M the MMO is being whether you're watching somebody stream, whether you're watching a YouTube video, whether you're playing it for yourself, or you're engaging in some forum, uh, trying to solve the puzzle that they've they've introduced. And I think that is one of the things that's foundational to the game itself. But that's my that's my. <laughs> Data, what do you think is missing for like if they're going to lean harder into the term MMO and be willing to market as such? Do you think there's any attribute to the game that should be there that's maybe a feature that's always been missing? Um. <clears throat> Just more community building features. Mm -hmm. Like that was that's the thing that I think a lot of people are going back to classic WoW for is like those tight knit communities on servers, right? I remember when I was on Frostmain, Frostmain server, like we had everyone had their own rivalries and and friendships and all that. Um, I don't think that's the biggest thing though. Like I think finally now that they're actually embracing the word MMO and they're starting to maybe build features towards that, I'm, I'm into the whole, you know, a player economy stuff. Mm -hmm. Literally a player economy would, for me would be kind of cool, even though I don't think destiny would ever reach that point where there's like an auction house and crafting systems and stuff like that. Like I love crafting. Like I love yeah. professions and MMOs so much. Um, so I think it would be pretty cool to see that happen in destiny, but the way, destiny works um i don't know if it would be able to support a crafting system that ends up being something actually valuable yeah it have to be valuable it, otherwise yeah. don't do it but that's yeah go ahead sorry <laughs> it, yeah it's just the way that you grind for gear like everything gives powerful rewards everything can increase your light level so like when you can go do some really easy stuff to increase your power level why would i bother hunting down a bunch of rare materials to craft a you know chess piece that also gives about the same effect mm -hmm. so they would have to really retool uh the entire economy of the game and create a full crafting system and have it be somewhat impactful uh for all of that to actually make sense to invest in and i just don't really see that happening unfortunately like maybe if they made it their sole focus on like one of these big expansions you know a couple of years down the road maybe but i i don't think it's what the game absolutely needs right now i right. think the game needs to focus on its core uh core activities and really like kind of bolstering them like dungeons the, the strikes the equivalent of dungeons um have been basically completely ignored for like the past year, like no extra features for them, nothing whatsoever. And strikes are a very core part of, ex uh, part of the destiny experience. Yeah. Very core part, much like dungeons are a very core part of MMOs. By the way, I'm, I'm over explaining things just in case people don't know what You're destiny good. is. I hope that's okay. You're fine. Um, so they've done basically nothing with the strike experience and they've done very little for the PVP experience which was another core experience of the game. So I'd like to see them refine those things first before they start going more broad MMO stuff. Like, let's get Destiny good, and then you can make the MMO good. Mm -hmm. So it was something like uh, like leaderboards within the clan or like things like that. I like the whenever games introduce some kind of sub uh, system in which that it's just whether it's like weekly or monthly different you know scores and things like that. That's what I would love to see. And they've kind of I teased with that. They've kind of like... Oh, on this thing we're gonna put a you know a scoring system, but then they, I mean, just... they technically have some stuff like that on the Bungie website. But mm -hmm. you just you have to go on the Bungie website and you have to dig through a bunch of you know sub links and sub menus in order to find those things. And then it's like eh, I don't really care about these stats anyway. We they have had the them same problem in for team. Game. Yeah, we have they like, had them yeah. in game, and you can scroll through stats and see like who's doing the most what in a week. That would be cool. Yeah, is it necessary? Eh, maybe not but it'd be cool. Yeah, not necessary, but absolutely cool. Now, our final, I guess, bullet point before we get into kind of our final thoughts is talking about kind of the power creep issue within 
uh, MMOs generally, but there's a, within like 14, we'll see that within any MMO, there's always the concept of power creep. One of the things they introduced as a part of Armor 2.0, kind of jumping back to the kind of the, the starting uh, piece of this, was the seasonal artifact. And so for Chris, if you didn't catch uh, my information on it, it literally is that every season you get the artifact and that applies some varying kind of power bonus, but that's going to change season to season. So power creep ends up being something that is seasonal and then it resets. For me, I don't know how I feel about it. I feel that it is an interesting solution to a power creep problem, but is that going to be something where, well, new season, you're kind of feeling like you're a, you know, a mouse on a, or a hamster on a wheel? Data. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a problem right now. Like, uh, two of the best, mount, uh, uh, best weapons in the game called Mountaintop and Recluse, uh, they destroy everything. PVE, PVP, like, it's one of the best loadouts, period, that did the game has ever seen. And they're legendary, which means you can still equip an exotic weapon in your power slot. So you're running around with, like, the craziest loadout we've ever seen. And now, if Bungie wants to incentivize using any other weapons, they have to make something even better than those things, which are already insane. But there's a lot of people who <clears throat> maybe think that's okay, right? Like, they want to feel super powerful all the time and just are blasting away at everything with these super powerful guns. So <clears throat> it really depends on who you ask on how they feel about power. I mean... Well, when, when you're on top <laughs> of the food chain... You feel pretty daggum good. <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. Feeling, yeah. I mean, every kid asks for ice cream. You can't always give it to them. Right. So there's people like myself who are like, look, if we don't do something about these weapons, we're never going to get anything interesting again. And we're also just going to have to play with these weapons forever because they're just the best options. Why would you use anything else? Uh, on top of the fact that there's no incentive to go challenge yourself in Destiny currently because there's no rewards, there's no activity features or structures or anything like that to actually support going and challenging yourself and then actually getting rewarded for it. Um, so I personally, like, I don't mind if we have like a full reset. I don't mind seasonal power creep and then it resets because at least we would get to experience these crazy things, but only for a set amount of time so that we can enjoy the thing. And it's like, okay, we enjoy the thing but it's not going to ruin the game. And now we can try a new crazy thing uh, <clears throat> for other people who maybe don't have, excuse me. Oh, you're good. <clears throat> for other people who don't have maybe as much time to grind, maybe they never feel like they get to the sense of that full power level. So every season they're just being reset over and over and they never reach that full power. And it's like, let me like work for this so I can get it. And then I can play with the cool thing. But then as soon as they hit the cool thing, they it resets. So like, you know, it, it, it's similar thing is happening. I feel, or I feel like is going to happen with the power or, or the, the mountaintop and recluse. Like these are super good guns. People are finally now starting to get, or getting around to actually using them. And I have a very strong feeling Bungie is going to do something about them. So it's like, I grinded all this time to get this stuff and now they're nerfing it. And it's like, I just wasted all of my time. Chris. So it really depends on what kind of player you are. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it, I think power creep is, is a problem that the devs are supposed to solve. We as players are not supposed to restrict our ability to go after the content. So if the content's out there, we should be able to consume it in whatever form it's been given to us, in whatever quantity we want to. Um, but it's their job to make sure that they're looking four and five years down the line. I'm not supposed to, rest oh, well, I don't want to equip the best loadout yet because then I won't be having fun six months from now. It is not my job to protect my player experience. I should play the game however it's fun today, and then they should have put themselves in a position where they can make it fun for me six months from now a year from now or else i can go find another game so like if they want me to be playing this game five years from now they need to be good shepherds of that and that's something that when you look at games that have had longer runs like final fantasy and world of warcraft you can see the long-term effects of power creep uh you know and it, it sounds like it's getting to an extreme degree in destiny and that resets a really hard thing to handle something like diablo handles it by a seasonal reset that everybody jumps back to zero but then what is the incentive for me to not just take a season off? Or if it's mid season, I might say, nah, I was going to play it, but now I'm not going to. And then they're not guaranteed that I have that same feeling when the next season starts. So they risk losing me as a player because I don't want to get on your hamster wheel. So I don't, I don't know. Seasonal things are just a really risky thing to do. Um, it's why MMOs have moved to like a two year cycle 
in, I mean, we have little mini ones at each patch, but like our two year cycle is our big reset, our big total overhaul. Right. And I think that's because that gives you enough time that people feel like, okay, I've still got a year left um, where they don't feel. So that's my question is so like, do you guys know, like, is this every season at the current season rate or is this every season at a new season rate? Uh, we actually don't know how this artifact thing is going to work. It says seasonal artifact. So I assume it might work like a battle pass situation in Fortnite, where like in Fortnite, you get the battle pass, you get experience, you get items in destiny, you get experience, you get to level up your artifact, which makes you more powerful over the course of the season. And then when the season ends, yeah, the artifact resets, so they give you a new artifact uh, with new abilities on it, and then you just kind of go from there. And they're gonna that, talk, they've talked about yeah, mixing how, and matching abilities, like like oh, that was fun in this season. Let's bring that back for this season. Now Fortnite, you get to keep your cosmetics from one season to the next. So what's the long term reward where I get to go? Oh man, you played season three. That's so cool. Like what what what's that thing that makes me jealous? We don't I know yet. Because otherwise, I'll just take seasons off. I can hop yeah. in whenever I want. And it's like, that's not a game developer should want me to play their game. Well, they, I mean, Bungie has kind of realized that, you know, they're offering seasons a la carte now. So this past year, if you wanted to play the new seasonal content, you needed to buy all of it at once. Mm -hmm. You could not buy them individually. So if you only wanted to play one season, you had to go buy the other two, which people did not like. Right. Um, <laughs> now they're offering it offering it seasonally so you don't feel obligated to be like all right well now i'm buying it so i have to play all the stuff and you don't want to feel obligated so they're giving more freedom to be like if you want to take a season off if nothing interests you you can take a season off and then you come try the next season right um i think they are okay with or like giving players that feeling and obviously there's the risk of well i missed this season and then your interest in the game starts to fade and then you just exit the game well, sphere that's it that's it there that's a, there's a that could be a whole podcast in and of itself what i'm about to say is that one of the things that chris has, has said in in previous videos talking about boycotts obviously boycott borderlands 3 was trending last week uh and the idea that if a company does something that you don't like you step away but as soon as they start doing things that you do like you it you kind of owe it in, in that relationship of boycotting to also come back because you need to tell them what is working and whether a season sells or doesn't sell players as a whole as a whole destiny community goes we actually have more real-time real impactful feedback than anything else oh nobody sure. bought you know, op, you know opulence everybody's been praising it obviously it's they are they're figuring it out from a development cycle luke smith came out i'm a software engineer so when he was talking about like how they're the the, the challenge in development with burnout and just like everybody's working so hard like that's a real risk that he has to manage overall but we have the realest impact now because let's say, let's say opulence. I'll just use that. Cause we don't know that. I don't know the names of the new seasons. If they've already announced them, forgive me. Internet. I think season, the next season is season of the undying. Okay. So season of the dying, let's say it comes out and people are just like, no, 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 no. Like that. No, you do not want to like nobody purchase it. Then that's real. Like, Oh, why did people not buy this? We need to figure it out and get it fixed. And then flipping that script, People really are purchasing it. That is what works. They literally, because money is the is the loudest communicator, especially because they're self publishing. Because they don't have Activision kind of calling um, whether the you know not every they're not Activision wasn't responsible for individual patches, but they still had that kind of behemoth to kind of address. And so, I think the relationship between Bungie and the player, the Destiny player, and and Destiny itself is going to be stronger because of their relationship with the seasonal content. And if the the artifact thing doesn't work, then they're going to find we'll learn that really quickly. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, I mean I I, I it, it's really kind of tough to comment before we yeah. know what these seasonal artifacts actually do and and how Bungie is going to be handling seasonal content like what Chris said, what's the incentive to like complete a season? right like mm -hmm. fortnite battle pass what's the incentive for level 100 well you get this really cool looking skin or or you know whatever and you get the next uh, season if you you know if, right if you choose to to use the the coin that you unlock for that yeah so for destiny it's it's that they have a similar question to answer what's my incentive to complete a season me personally i like being a completionist i'm going to go get all the stuff anyway yeah i'm not your average player right what's the average player's incentive to purchase a season so on, especially well, especially when you're comparing 
similar games. So if you have a player who's not committed to an yeah. exam, ecosystem right so you have a player who says i've tried eso in the past i hear it's gotten a lot better i've tried destiny in the past i hear it's gotten a lot better and i'm tired of whatever mainline game I'm, I'm playing or i'm tired of final fantasy i cleared shadowbringers i'm good or you know classic didn't do it for me or bfa is just not my cup of tea okay i want to go to destiny or eso what's important here is that they understand how to kind of it comes back down to that term that marketing term how do you how do you commit me because if destiny says okay well each season is its own standalone thing and it's the own chapter be consumed at your will and then eso's got something cool going on well then i go choose eso and now destiny's risk is what if i'm happy there now they never get me i never leave i said i was going to try that and then go to destiny and i just never leave so i mean it's very much like like you know you you meet some girl at a bar and then you're like yeah go dance with that other guy go spend the evening with him we'll hang out later maybe like <laughs> what if he's great so like it just it's that very risk um of, of le- encouraging us to try other games the risk is what if they're good right um, there's a lot of good games on the market right now and it's in final fantasy's best interest that i don't drop my sub um, so, I mean, that's my concern with the seasonal thing and, and how they address all this, but I'm, I'm interested in what they're doing and, uh, it's exciting to see so much growth around the community and see what you guys are thinking. As we move into kind of final thoughts, mm-hmm. do you have any like concerns or hopes that you can speculate on, or is there anything that, that you're, you're just super excited about and you've never thought it was a better time to get in destiny? Um, I mean, I do think it is probably one of the better times to get into Destiny if you've never played it before. Um, they've they've come a long way since the launch of Destiny 2, uh, for sure. Concern-wise, I am very much worried about the how, how they're going to be handling seasons. I think the way that they were doing it over the past year has been pretty good, but as it's been pointed out, it's not really sustainable for them to do what they've been doing for the past year. Like, they've been creating entirely new activities entirely new reward structures and systems and that's just not sustainable like they they need to basically standardize sort of how they do rewards and and all that kind of stuff um also i have concerns over story related things destiny has basically 17 different storylines it feels like that (laughs) haven't really led anywhere or like have been kind of dropped off or maybe they've just been completed really quickly and it never feels like I'm experiencing the story of destiny. I'm just living in the world and things happen to be happening. And I have to go, you know, like a police <laughs> officer, like, Oh, well, we gotta know. We got a four thirteen over here on broad street. Like that's send in, the gar- send in the guardian. <laughs> right. That's how it's kind of how it's kind of felt. We've never had, um, like, I guess maybe the taken and Oryx and, and all that kind of stuff in Savathun has been maybe the overall, sort of villain in the game but even then it's like ah they ah, they're taking a break like here's a different villain that you'll beat in one season <laughs> and i understand the appeal to that for like the average player it's like you want to come in you want to beat the boss you want to feel like you accomplished something but if you're a long-term player it's just like when when are we getting to to, to the, the juicy stuff like when are all these timelines gonna converge and when is these crazy things going to happen? Like what's going on with this character, this character, this character, how are they all linked? And we're not there yet. And we've been playing a long time and I'm just wondering if the seasons are going to impact that at all. Cause even what we're doing with shadow keep, it's like, we're going back to old thing with the old character and like this crazy things happening. And it's like, okay, but does that relate to what just happened with, with this guy? Or is it, is this like a new thing? <laughs> There's like a different guy coming, but like what's, what is going on? So I think <laughs> players would definitely like to see some sort of story progression within Destiny, even though Destiny is an MMO and you need these games to go for a really long time. I think to answer that question for me, I'm excited about going back to the moon. Uh, I, I don't know why. Uh, I missed it, I guess, in some ways. And nostalgia, see, nostalgia factor for nostalgia. sure. Nostalgia, and I, I, the thing that I've always said is that Destiny Two has been this journey to get back to Destiny One, and it's going to feel a little bit more complete having access to the moon. And I'm really excited for New Light being a, a kind of an easier entry point for people who to come in and start checking it out. Um, as somebody who was, it was heart wrenching to leave. Um, and I'm actually really glad I did. I'm really glad that I stepped away from the game because now coming back after they pretty much did the things that I was saying, like if they did, uh, it's not full cross play, but cross save, I was like, cross save is good enough for me. 
uh, you know, and then obviously with the leaving Activision, I was like, okay, I'm going to check them out again. And coming back in and, and catching up through Forsaken has just been a really good experience. And the fact that I was playing uh, with Julie and she was having a good time with it too speaks kind of a, it speaks a, a lot of praise to the game. Uh, itself so i'm glad i stepped away but i'm also just as happy as that i've come back data where can people find you what are you working on uh you know that you want people to know about you can find me on the internet uh twitch.tv slash dado twitter is uh, at dado's destiny and youtube is dado does destiny all I the like links i yeah. like to keep everything different so it's really really hard to find me <laughs> we the same way we're work to game and then work number two i did it that way because if somebody searched and they did like, is it a two or is it two? I was like, search it. It's going to, yeah, you'll find uh, us either way. Yeah, if you search data on the internet, you're, you're either going to find me or like a data backup company. I found your data it's, backup it's company. <laughs> yeah. It's not yours, it's, but I was... I'm not the data backup company. <laughs> I, had to, I had to, I had to, I had to put <laughs> destiny. I had to search data and destiny to get <laughs> images of you. Otherwise it was yeah. like, all right, these are servers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chris, uh, where can people find you? What are we working on? Uh, well, the only reason I haven't gotten back into Destiny right now, because I have multiple friends that are getting back in, including Brian, and um, it's it's gotten me to the point that I'm willing to play. The problem is that it's, as of this recording, August 15th, and WoW Classic goes live on the 26th in North America. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, I just can't, in good conscience, pick up a game 11 days before something else, because... I would at that point be assuming Destiny is not going to be good because uh, I'm telling you I'm not I'm going to be done playing it in 11 days. So uh, I'm I'm interested in that. I've been playing a lot of 14. Um, finally starting to hit that wall on Shadowbringers. It's one of the best game experiences I've had in the last 10 years. It's still been a long journey since the end of June, so I'm ready to kind of start slowing down on that and get into classic. And uh, that's that's about it. I'm excited to talk to Xandri next week. Yeah, next week we are we've got Xandri back on the podcast to talk about the story of what World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy XIV. And then after uh, that, we've got a lot of really good uh, guest lineup for that for the show. Very excited! It's going to be a really fun couple of months for everybody. We've got lined up. Dado, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. If you have a few minutes and no worries or pressure, if you got to run, I just noticed the Final Fantasy X poster behind you. And uh, and after we wrap, I, I kind of would like to just ask you some questions about Final Fantasy, if that's okay. No pressure. Don't have to. Sure, I've been biting my tongue for an hour. Well, it's it's Chris's favorite it's game. It's my final. It's, it's my favorite. Oh, it's my favorite game as well. Oh my god, <laughs> it's where my name comes from. This literally was the wrong. Like it's like let's talk about the now podcast too. No, um, but anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stick around with chat here for a few minutes uh, and talk about some Final Fantasy because I was like, wait a minute, that's holy crap. <laughs> that's that's a really good. I, I saw it when we went five. <laughs> anyway, so with that, for work to game, my name's Brian. My name's Chris. I'm Dado. Hi. I didn't know I was doing that. You're good. Nobody does. We don't warn anybody. <laughs> Never warn them. It's the second time if they if they if they if they miss it, I, I start to question them. Like, <laughs> but no. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for watching, guys. Hope you have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Whoa, you guys are the best. Jorge, Kyle, Philip, Thirty One Edwards, Rock Druid, Corey Longwith, Aaron, Axis, Hambone, Lady Wild, the plays. CN uh, Navs, this is going too fast. Christopher, Phil, Shun, Dragons, Soul, Keen, Knights, Assassin, Carlos, Sherry, Robert, Leyland, Davon, Tim, Jojo World, Terra, Soar, Scrub Lord, Trevor, Mill, Little Almond, 70s, Kimber, Tyler, oh my god, I'm so sorry, Cody, Legend, um, Carlos, Edless, Jonathan, Jade, Sai, Derek, Brandon, Aaron, Riku, Daryl, Chemistro, Lauren, The Wolf, The Gar, Kelly, Anthony, Solid, John, Huskry, oh my god, uh, everybody, Dark Later, Christopher, uh, Vestman, Sean, Nopi, Brian, Tom, Dylan, Silent, whew, oh, I missed your names, I'm sorry, I love you all, <laughs> oh my gosh, that was tough.